Thank you, and good morning. Thanks to the organizer. I will describe the SOX experiment at Gran Sasso, which is going to happen for the search of sterile neutrinos in, at the beginning of next year. So I will be quite brief and uh, schematic on the motivations because they are certainly very well known. Uh, we had, uh, in the last 15 years, uh, a golden age of neutrino physics with the establishment of the three mixing angles and uh, two uh, mass scale scenario. We have a good understanding of neutrino physics at this level, although, of course, we still lack a complete underst understanding of the neutrino mass of its uh, kind, and also we don't know the CP phases, although results are coming on that as well. And we do know that standard model is made of three neutrinos. That said, there is still room for corrections because most of the measurements are not very high precision, and there are experimental results which may be out of this uh, standard scenario. These results uh, uh, may be because deep in our hearts we don't believe them, we call them anomalies, but they are actually experimental facts that cannot be fit into, into the standard model. Certainly, the LSND experiment has made uh, an appearance uh, experiment with muon neutrinos to electron neutrinos, which is still unexplained. And there are reasons to believe that the understanding of reactors and also the, the chromium and argon-37 sources can be out of the standard scenario. Uh, of course, the ev evidence is just uh, limited to maximum three sigma in the best cases, but they, they all point to electron volt scale, and although the parameters which are still available from several, for example, recent reactor experiment, I think that it's fair to say that a clear and clean experiment on this is called for. And in Borexino, we have an opportunity because we have uh, certainly the less radioactive detector available on the planet. And uh, if we can manage to bring a neutrino source close to Borexino, we have a unique opportunity to measure short distance neutrino oscillations with unprecedented cleanliness and, uh, and precision. In general, uh, the experiment you are talking about is an experiment in which you have a neutrino source, which can be a reactor, or in, in our case, a radioactive source. And uh, you want to have the capability to measure oscillations directly, even by having a movable detector. And this is what it's done in some reactor experiment, which I'm not covering because I'm sure I've been covering uh, uh, somewhere else. Uh, but also, you could have a segmented, or in the case of Borexino, a detector that is capable to detect the position so that you can me measure the flux as a function of the distance, on which, of course, you have the overlapping uh, 1 over r square uh, flux so decay plus the effect of oscillations that we can, you can try to disentangle as waves. So I will call oscillometry the idea to find the probability waves in the distribution of the events. Uh, in general, uh, these are the parameters highlighted in this paper that you have to control. Uh, the size of the source should be as small as possible, and this is an advantage of a radioactive source because in the case of SOX, the source will be a liter or even less, while the reactor is usually big if it is a research reactor or very big if it is a power reactor. Of course, from the reactor, you can have more flux because you have a higher power, but you also, hold, as you also have a lot of background. And what I will try to, exp to, to prove is that you can have a zero background experiment in a detector like Borexino if you use a source, which can be very close. The minimum distance between the source of SOX and the Borexino detector will be four meter, which is a closer distance uh, compared to any reactor experiments. Another problem of reactor experiments or any, or any experiment that happens on the surface and not on the ground 
is that you have background due to muons and due to fast neutrons that come from the reactor. These backgrounds are relevant, so none of the experiments done on the market are background free in the same sense in which we are background free, as I will show in a moment. Uh, how we plan to detect antineutrinos and what is the experiment? The key point is a source, is a radioactive source made of cerium-144, but actually the real decay which we care is the decay of praseodymium to neodymium, which makes uh, this part of the spectrum, which is the one above the inverse beta decay uh, energy threshold. So you have a source of cerium with a lifetime of uh, 411 days and a, um, half, half of the decay time of 285 days. You have a spectrum of uh, uh, antineutrinos which goes well above uh, the threshold, so this part of the spectrum is the one you can get. If you make a source of 150 kilocurie, which is what we think we can do and we have good reason to believe we can do, you have a sufficient antineutrino flux to, to collect about 20,000 events in a year or so, which makes the experiment uh, extremely precise. If you do that uh, with the detector Liborexino, as I will show in a moment, you have uh, a zero vector experiment. The experiment has a long history in the sense that the idea to use uh, neutrino sources in Borexino dates back to the beginning of the project, so it's not our or my idea. We uh, renewed uh, five years ago by proposing to European community, both in France and in Italy, projects aimed at that. And we finally agreed, uh, myself and Thierry Lasser and Stefan Schoenert and others, to put all the forces together for a single experiment uh, in Borexino. Why Borexino is better? Uh, well, uh, you can see from this plot, uh, uh, Borexino experiment is, of course, a solar neutrino experiment made of 300 ton of liquid scintillator, super clean, I would say. Uh, the, this part of the, of the planet is the cleanest uh, thing ever built. You have uh, contamination levels at the level, uh, unprecedented in any low background detector. You have a detection capability of both neutrinos and antineutrinos, but here I have reported the, the last paper we made on geoneutrinos. Why is this? Because this is our background. And if you look at the plot, uh, you may believe it's a lot, but if you look at the numbers, you understand that it's not, because these are about 30 events collected in four years, and this is the a total background we have, coming from geoneutrinos, which is the yellow part, and the reactor neutrinos coming from reactors all over Europe. What you would call background is a tiny thing over here, which is not even visible, so it's much less than one event per year, accidental background into the experiment. So except the geoneutrinos and reactor neutrinos, which are well known, but are at the level of 30 events in several years, the signal is this one, more than 10,000 events, it will be close to 20,000 actually, compared to a few, if any, background events. So it's going to be a very clean experiment, of course, detecting antineutrinos using the typical reince cohen technique, uh, which I guess it's well known and I don't need to, to, to explain too much. So what is the logic of the experiment? You build the source, uh, you bring it down below Borexino. There is a tunnel already foreseen by the builder of Borexino, which will allow the study of the flux as a function of the distance from minimum of four meters, because this distance from the source to the center will be 8.1 meters but the radius is about four meters. So you will start detecting events at four meters from the source up to 12. So you span a distance, an L over E, if you take E of the order of two MeV on average, or three, 2.5, uh, you have a span of L over E from about two to about uh, uh, six or seven. 
So you will have a very strong sensitivity to oscillation over this uh, distance scale, which with the delta m squared of the order of one electron volt happens to be the best geometry you can imagine. Uh, this is the big entrance of the tunnel with the, the device, which is actually also a calorimeter, which we will we'll use to insert the source into the tunnel. This is a final configuration made with the real tungsten shield, which we will use for the experiment, of course, without the cerium yet. We made this test in May 2017, and everything is running uh, smoothly. So uh, I told you about oscillometry. This is also an idea coming from uh, Raju Raghavan. Many ideas of this field are coming from that source. He made this observation that you could, uh, at that time in his um, uh, solar neutrino R&D, uh, to make this kind of experiment using a source of proper size and energy. So you can make a standard disappearing experiment because, as I will show you, we can measure very well the intensity of the source. So we will know the flux with 1% precision or so. But also, due to the geometrical effect and the numbers, we will be able to measure the event rate as a function of the distance quite well. This is the function you expect from pure geometry, from the fact that the flow uh, goes down by 1 over r square. But of course, if you s overlap the oscillations, you have a, a, a probability as a function of the distance that you can fit. This is what we call oscillometer, and uh, it can add to the uh, standard disappearance. So you have a disappearance, and you have spatial waves as an additional tool. The advantage of spatial waves are, is twofold. It increases the sensitivity in a way that does not depend on the knowledge of the source, which is important. But let me say, in case we are very lucky and nature is extremely kind to us and show us a signal, we have a model-independent way to show a signal. Because if you see the waves, there is no question that you are seeing something that is non-standard. So this is uh, the possibility of uh, the signal you expect. The curve uh, here is what you expect without oscillation, while, of course, with the uh, lucky parameters, you could find uh, strong uh, uh, distortion. The signature is uh, better depicted here, because as you can see, the L over E will give you a pattern of dependence of both the distance and the energy. You can measure the energy of the antineutrino by looking, of course, of the prompt event with some resolution. You measure the position with about 10 centimeter resolution. And this pattern is a powerful tool to confirm in a model independent way if there is a distortion from standard physics. In case of standard physics, you, you should have a list of uh, circles here or of uh, very smooth curves. If you see wiggles, you have a signal that uh, there is something that is non-standard. A uh, few words about uh, how to do it, because uh, this is nice in principle, but it's enormously difficult, let me say technically, politically, communicationally, as you like. So we, will fa we still have to face a lot of difficulties, and I, I want to be frank. I can't guarantee we will do it until the source is inside the pit, because uh, many problems may arise and, and probably will arise. But we did all the best, and uh, uh, I, I'm going to tell you what we did. First of all, let me thank CA, the French uh, organization in Saclay, who is a big uh, part of this business, together with INFN, of course, and the Borexino collaboration as a whole, the TUM University in Munich, who has uh, given a substantial contribution to many aspects. But uh, as I told you, this is a very non-standard experiment. The production, the transportation, the authorization is uh, absolutely non-trivial business. Uh, how you do it? Well, to make such a large amount of cerium-144, the best and uh, uh, possibly the only way is to extract it from spent nuclear fuel. 
there is a plant in Russia in Mayak site who normally does this reprocessing of nuclear fuel and they still do the separation of the elements. It's not done anymore in the United States, it's not done anymore in Europe as far as we know, but the Russians still do the reprocessing of the fuel in a standard way to, re to separate the different isotopes. So they do have a plant which has the capability to separate the rare earth and then to disentangle them using displacement chromatography to separate the cerium from the lanthanum and from the other and from the praseodymium itself. This uh, chromatography makes with final calcination a powder, a solid, which is a very important thing. It's not a liquid, it's not a gas, it's a solid, which makes its confinement much easier. And this powder can be compressed and put into a small capsule that is this big stainless steel, double capsule, sealed of course, double sealing, double capsule, with copper disc to keep uh, the heat under control. This capsule will be inserted finally into a tungsten container, which is 19 centimeter thick. 19 centimeter thick uh, to provide full shielding to gammas, uh, to put a strong uh, uh, limit uh, on neutron uh, activities, because of course, Gran Sasso is first of all a scientific underground lab where uh, neutron activity and radioactivity in general is, uh, of course, a very sensitive thing from the scientific point of view. So we have a strong limit which goes much beyond radio protection. This number of neutrons is exactly the requirement we got from the lab to keep uh, the system, the, the science safe in the lab. Uh, the, of course, there is, of course, a radio protection issue. That's why we have this super bulky container which stops most of the gammas, keeping the usage of the source possible, even for workers that are not radio workers. We, none of us will need medical um, authorization or stuff like this that is normally needed when you are a radioactive uh, uh, operator. This device will produce uh, radiation similar to a small uh, uh, radiography to each operator, no more than that. It's going to be two ton weight and very bulky, and it's ready done in China. This is an example of the calorimeter we will use to measure, as I will tell you in a moment. Uh, the plant will be is in Russia. Will in my yak site, and this is an example of the detail of the purification. The key point is this, this chromatography system that is made of, of a device called the canyon, which through displacement chromatography separates the different rare earths in, uh, in this plant. This is work is in progress. The solution is already there. They started the, the chromatography in these weeks and they will give us the source ready to be delivered in Gran Sasso next spring. Uh, we made a lot of work to be sure that the system is uh, safe and can be operated easily. For example, one study, a lot of work we did was on heat because of course there is power, 1.2, 1.3 kilowatts of power inside the source, so the source is quite hot, but not too hot. Uh, with normal handling, uh, without a specific uh, cooling, uh, we'll have a surface temperature of 80 degrees, which is uh, uh, less than a boiling pot uh, we, 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 we manage every day. And it's not much bigger than a pot, it's like that. So it's not a big deal and can be handled just with the proper gloves and a little bit of, uh, of attention. Uh, the transportation is also a big, uh, a big issue. Uh, it's which you can solve easily paying 1.3 million euros to, for the train, for the ship, for the truck down to Gran Sasso. Another science issue is the capability to know the power of the source because you want to know the neutrino flux to the precision you need to do a disappearing experiment. The, the way we found is the twofold. First of all, and this is what I will discuss today, is to measure very precisely the heat. 
uh, we built two calorimeters, one uh, uh, myself and Stefan, who is there in Tum, we, we shared the, the resources and we made what we call the Genova Tum calorimeter. And there is a second one made at CA. They are different uh, in concept, but they do exactly the same thing, which is measure the power of uh, the source by measuring the increase of temperature of a water flow through the system. A system in which uh, you, you isolate the source so well that you are 100% sure that at least of a level better than one per thousand, all the heat goes into the water. This can be done. We tested with several blind tests and electrical heater, and we proved ourselves that we can indeed measure this power to better, to at the level of one per thousand. How you do? An instrument like this one, this is a, a, a picture of the Genova Tum calorimeter. This is a drawing of the CA calorimeter. Uh, this is essentially a cryostat working in inverse mode in the sense that the source is inside. You make vacuum. You isolate completely the source into a vacuum chamber with the radiator and all things that you typically have uh, in a cryostat to prevent heat from going inside. In this case, we want to prevent heat to go outside, but the technology is very the same. And of course, to avoid the system to blow up, you have a very well controlled water flow in which all the power will go. So you measure very well the flow. Coriolis flow meter allows you to do better than one per thousand. High sensitivity thermometer gives you better than one per thousand. So if you control the loss, you get better than one per thousand. And we, we did it because uh, we know that there is vacuum, so no convection, zero power loss for convection. Radiation shielding allow to keep the loss below one watt. And the conduction is below a tenth of a watt thanks to this uh, wiring in Kevlar, which I like a lot to remember that I developed for Quore. So this is uh, the same technology we developed for the suspension of Quore that we reuse for, for the suspension of socks in a similar context. But in both cases, you have to hold a very relevant weight without introducing thermal heat, thermal conductance into the system. So the power is 1.5 kilowatt. So as you can see, the loss is at the level of per thousand or less. This is a proof that it's true, because this is a blind test we did with an electrical heater. And this is the asymptotic convergence of the expected power, the, the, the dark and the measured one, the green. And uh, in several blind tests, we proved that, that indeed, uh, uh, actually, the real people who are the students who are doing the real job uh, are able to recover the correct number in all cases. So this is my last but one slide, uh, summary of the sensitivity. Um, I did not cover another aspect uh, of uh, the problem. Once you know the power to go to the flux, you needed to know very well the spectrum of the serum. This is still an open problem. We don't know yet this. We have planned to do measurement of the cerium and praseodymium spectra, and we have to do it. Otherwise, we will be dominated by the, dominated by the knowledge of the praseodymium spectrum, which, as of today, is not known to the level of precision that we need to uh, use this high precision of the power. I'm not covering this because I have no results, but we have plans. So we are very well aware of the problem. And as soon as the source will be into the pit, we will have a year and a half or two years to, to, to do this measurement very precisely. It's going to be an important part of the project. If we manage to get one per five percent in calibration, so it's not one, we don't dream to maintain the one per thousand. We hope that we go from one per thousand to one percent through a precise measurement of the spectrum, we will get this sensitivity, which will give a clear discovery power if you believe in reactor anomaly. If you don't, uh, we will essentially uh, cancel it from the scientific debate. 
This is to prove you that we are in good shape. This is a mock-up of the capsule. This is the real tungsten shield in Gran Sasso. Delivery is expected in March 31st in St. Petersburg, so sometime in spring 2018 in Gran Sasso, if many of the showstoppers I had do not really stop us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Berlin, for the talk.